The Radical. Fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, and individual rights. This is The Yaron Brook Show. All right, everybody, welcome. Welcome to The Yaron Brook Show. It's been a while since uh, I've been in my studio at home. I'm not going to be here long. Enjoy it while it lasts. All right, we've got a lot to talk about today, and it could be a good show because I could get really pissed off, and you know I get better as I get angrier because uh, today's uh, topics, all of them, you know, most of them are uh, ones easy to get pissed off at. Uh, so, um, yeah, I'm back from uh, Feed and Fest. We're going to talk about um, the whole attack on Section 230, the attack on free speech, the attack on social media, the attempt of government to manipulate social media and to, and to, and to dictate content for social media. We're seeing the Biden administration engage in activities that I think are clearly, clearly can be construed as violations of the First Amendment. We'll see how it all plays out. Uh, so we're, talk, we're going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about where that comes from, who started it. And then um, two movie reviews, two movie reviews. One that uh, Shazbot paid for uh, once upon a time in Hollywood. Unfortunately, I don't see him on yet. Maybe he'll join us in a little while and get the uh, movie review uh, live. And then the other one uh, is going to be a movie review of a movie I watched yesterday on the plane flying uh, to Puerto Rico from um, Rapid City, South Dakota, uh, which is the movie Outpost, and uh, I'm gonna get pretty, 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 pretty upset when I do the review of Outpost. So uh, if you like to see Iran angry and passionate and pissed off, then um, stick around for the review of the movie Outpost. Uh, I've got a lot to say about it. Um, we've got... Um, yeah, so there's a lot to talk about. I, I, I talked a little bit. I did a show for Freedom Fest, so you know I was there. It was uh, in um, in South Dakota, Rapid City, uh, near near uh, a lot of the tourist sites. It, it was it, it, interesting, interesting. I wasn't that impressed with uh, Rapid City, um, and I, you know, a lot of getting around was almost impossible because uh, very few Uber, very few uh, Lyft. Uh, they they don't. They don't, you can't get them at the airport. You have to take a shuttle. There are no taxis. No taxis at the airport. Only airport I've ever been to where there's just not a single taxi outside. Uh, and generally, um, generally a challenging place. But, uh, you know, good conference, interesting conference, a lot going on. So that's going to be, that's, that was exciting. All right, uh, Dean, I did get your question. So I have it lined up. I'll get to it after we cover some of the topics that I want to cover today. Uh, and uh, Rutha says, can someone help sponsor for Iran to review Sartre's No Exit and Camus' The Stranger? And what's your view of existentialism? Okay, I'll, I'll leave the what's my view of existentialism to, um, to the uh, Super Chat questions for later. But if somebody, you know, reviewing those books, it's going to take a lot of money for me to read those books. I've got other priority. Oh, Shaz Bud is here. Excellent. So he, he'll actually hear the review of his movie uh, live. I do have a sponsored show I still have to do uh, on, on, on cultural intelligence, um, and I will do that probably while I'm traveling. We'll see. Uh, maybe I'll do it from another culture. Anyway, travel overseas. I leave tomorrow. Tomorrow night, I leave for Israel, um, and I was hoping to go from Israel to London, and it looks like the UK is nuts. It's even worse than Israel, and um, it's going to be very difficult for me to get to London. So I'll probably get there, but I don't know. We'll, we'll see. I'll probably get there. I have to spend to get there. I have to spend ten full days in Israel, and that's only if they don't change Israel's designation from green to amber. And if they change it to amber, I'm screwed. I can't go to UK. So anyway. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of challenges ahead of me in the next two weeks, but I'm going to Israel, see my family, see my parents who I haven't seen in a couple of years, and um, you know who've not been well during COVID. So uh, it's it's yeah, it's 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 about time 
for me to uh, to visit uh, visit Israel. So uh, um, we'll do that. Uh, I'm hoping to do some shows from Israel, but that will very much depend on the quality of the Wi-Fi, the quality of the internet connection. If the internet connection is reasonable, I will do the shows. I, I uh, this trip to California and South Dakota showed that when I have decent um, Wi-Fi, my new laptop. I can do a full show off of my new laptop. So uh, it's an M1 uh, Apple, you know, MacBook Air, and you can still do the whole show. You can stream, or you can do the camera, you can do the whole thing. So uh, we'll do that uh, from the road as long as, um, anyway, as long as the Wi-Fi is good enough, and, and we'll do that from Israel and, and from the UK. We'll, we'll, if I ever get to the UK, we'll see. All right. Deep breath. All right, and uh, what else? Um, that's it. Logistically, I, I, I'll be gone two weeks. So I hope I can do some shows. Otherwise, you're stuck with reruns uh, or old debates or old uh, lectures and things like that. Oh, before I continue, um, I have to remind you all that uh, we are using the Super Chat feature today to raise some money. Because I don't know if I'm going to do any shows for the rest of the month. There'll be a show tomorrow at 3 o'clock, which is our usual hundred dollar uh, sponsor show uh, so it'll be a q a show with super chat but in order kind of to reach my the monthly minimum that i set for the show we have to over the next two days given that i don't know if we'll do another show in july we have to raise 1200 bucks over the next two days so um you know dean and rutha and Harrison have got us started have got us rolling but um, we're going to have to do a lot more than that in order to get to, uh, to uh, 1200 bucks. So Ali is here. Ali's going to keep track. Ali will remind you of where we are, how much we need still to get. And uh, it'd be great if we could get the support we need uh, so that this month kind of is on par with the other months this year, which uh, $5,000 has been kind of a, a, a minimum, we need $1,200 to get there. $5,000, that's net of all the fees and everything. All right, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, really appreciate that. And I, I will also add, I'm kind of exhausted, but, you know, we'll, we'll still do the show. Oh, um, we, we, just because I got home after midnight last night from the flight from Rapid City, so. Okay, oh, uh, Tom asks, Michael Schoma. Michael Schumer interview, I saw him at Freedom Fest. Uh, we had a great conversation. It was really interesting. I, 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 uh, and um, he promised me that it was scheduled to be released, the Michael Schumer interview is scheduled to be released uh, by, uh, I think, on August 7th or 8th. So what are we, two weeks away? Or, or le you know, it, it'll be, yeah, I'm, I'm coming back on the 8th. Uh, so it'll be released just before I come back. So um, it was an interview. I think you'll enjoy it. I critique him for his chapter on Ayn Rand in his famous book. Um, and we talk a lot about objectivism, Ayn Rand, the application. And uh, I thought it was a good interview. So, and, and uh, you know, he was open to my being critical of him. It wasn't really a debate. It was more him interviewing me and raising kind of objections to me. But, but that was, it's good, kind of pushing me a little bit. Um, and, and, and we did talk about his significantly flawed view of the objectivist movement, which he presents in his book, and his, his, his wrong view of morality, of ethics, so, uh, and why I think he needs Ayn Rand. And, and, uh, and he, you know, it's sad that he doesn't get it, even though he's read her. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, Let's see, one second. All right. All right, remember, the more Super Chat you do, the quicker we can get there. Ali has a goal of $1,200 for this show, but the minimum is 400 right? So anywhere between 400 and 1200 would be great. Anything under 400 would be horrible. Over 1200 would be amazing, amazing. So uh, and if anybody out there wants to jumpstart us that would be great and of course any super chat question that uh, of twenty dollars or more will have priority in the meantime we just have one that actually came through uh, paypal so uh, i will get to that later 
Oh, there we go. Ragnar of the Desert is getting us off to a good start with 100 bucks. Thank you, Ragnar of the Desert. And uh, it's a great name. He is the, uh, the, 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 you know, the, I, I just see him sailing in the sands and uh, in the name of justice. All right. So this last week, week and a half now of traveling, it's hard to tell uh, timing wise, has really been, really been scary. Um, I think, I think the last four or five years have really seen an escalation in the threats to free speech in this country, to the threats of what I call recognized free speech, because there's already speech that is not recognized and, and therefore it, it, the free speech is already violation. For example, commercial speech is not protected. But to protected speech, I, I don't think I've ever seen as many threats to protected speech over the last, uh, as I've seen over the last four or five years. And then this last week, this has escalated to a level of, oh my God, is the government really gonna be able to get away with this? And given that I haven't seen much uproar about it, you could argue that yes, the government can and is going to get away with it. You can think of it as, as you know, Ayn Rand always said that free speech is, is kind of the bastion. If free speech falls, how do we advocate for change? How do we fight for a better world? What is left for us in terms of fighting? Free speech is, is, is the one right that we must protect above all others so that we can fight for our other rights, so that we can demand that our other rights be protected, be respected. But without the ability to speak, we have nothing. And as compared to Europe, as compared to the rest of the world, the United States has been a bastion of free speech. It's been a place where you could count on the fact that the government was not going to outlaw you. Europe has hate speech laws, which basically say the things that the powers to be view as hate speech hasn't affected us yet, us being, let's say, Ayn Rand objectivism, but could, imaginably, because hate speech, I mean, how do you define hate speech? It's completely non-objective. It's completely arbitrary, completely left at the discretion of the regulator. Well, America was one place in which there didn't seem to be much risk of hate speech laws because, you know, our, our Constitution protects free speech explicitly. And the Supreme Court, with all its problems and its, all its failings, has done a pretty good job protecting that speech. And, and to a large extent, we live in an America where there is more legal free speech, there's less governmental restrictions on speech than maybe ever before. Arthur, thank you. That is uh, very generous. Um, and um, I will get to your question in a little bit. But, it, but last week it broke. It didn't break. It was just an offhand comment by Biden's press secretary, that they are, quote, advising Facebook of what they consider misinformation. Now, of course, they're using as a cover for this violation of free speech. What they're using as a cover is a so-called emergency of COVID. I think the emergency is over, really. Whoever doesn't want to get vaccinated Seems to me like that's their problem. But, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there against vaccines. There's a lot of stuff out there about alternative treatments. There's a lot of stuff out there that from a scientific perspective, you could say is questionable. 
But historically, we have understood that it's not, 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 not the government's job to screen for misinformation. Indeed, the government screening, banning what it considers misinformation is clearly a violation of the First Amendment. It is clearly a restriction on our free speech rights. And yet, the Biden administration was suggesting that that's exactly what they're doing. Now, they're just advising Facebook, advising them. At the same time, as there are bills going through Congress right now to regulate, control, break up big tech. And you would think that big tech would be advised to listen to the advice that the Biden administration has for them. Otherwise, who knows? If those bills will not be <laughs> passed, signed into law. So here's a club. I'm going to beat you over the head with it. But I'm just advising you not to say X. I'm just advising you to take the stuff that I don't like off the internet. And it's, in a sense, been like this for a long time. Because, of course, this started at least this round of it. Now, we might be able to go back further in history and see this in past administrations. But it certainly started with, in the last few years, and I'm gonna I'm gonna get to some of the bills that are going through Congress right now. The pretty scary stuff. What 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 the Democrats are proposing to pass in terms of uh, you know attacking big tech and, and and restricting their freedom of speech. But this of course started with with Trump. Trump was the one who raised the whole issue of Section 230. Trump and Republicans in Congress. You know, last year, Republicans in Congress actively engaged in attempts to modify Section 230. Now, put it, let me just say this. It very well could be that we should modify Section 230. It very well could be, as Amy uh, Peacock has said, there are ways to make it better law. Uh, you know, we could get into that whole debate. I'm not that convinced. But let's... You know, I'm willing to give that a benefit of the doubt. But just remember that once you open the can of worms, once you start talking about it, debating it, putting it on the table, the people most passionate about these issues, the people who most want to constrain speech are going to jump on the opportunity. They're the ones who are going to be dictating what is and isn't appropriate speech. They're the ones who are going to use the, what do you call it, uh, the, 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 the rewriting of 230 to benefit them, you will lose control. You, the better people, will actually lose control over the ability. To reshape 230. It won't be what you want it to be. Let's assume Republicans had a positive view a good view, they don't, but if they did, they're not going to be the ones determining it. Not the better elements between the, within the Republican Party. So, when Trump raised this, right, Trump raised it, he was clearly threatening to use, to repeal Section 230, which would clearly harm, damage the business model of the social media groups. And he clearly was using it throughout his presidency, particularly in the latter two years, as a club against those groups. You could argue, I don't know if it's true, but you could argue that Twitter would have kicked Trump off the platform much earlier, if not for the fact that he was threatening use of 230. 
which is a clear violation of Twitter's free speech, if that's true. I mean, Trump himself tweeted at some point, I think in October 2020, October last year, he tweeted repeal section 230. Did he ask for anything in return? Did he use his club? Of course he did, but in less of an explicit way as the Democrats are doing. And then, of course, there was the case, which I commented on at the time, where the White House was considering not approving the deal between CNN and AT&T because it was not happy with CNN and because it was not happy with certain properties, because it was not happy with speech. So Trump launched a real attack on the principles of free speech. His criticisms of media, his criticisms of the newspapers, not just a private citizen's criticisms, but his president who wields a large club. Very dangerous. Very dangerous. Now, I know, I know many of you hate big tech. Oh, they are so powerful. I don't buy it. Sorry, I don't buy it. I mean, I'm critical of them, but I don't think they're that powerful. For the first time in all of human history, we have alternatives to big media. You can, you, you can online find whatever you want, whatever alternative view you want, any perspective you want. You can find anything you want. Big tech isn't that powerful. Not as compared to, let's say, CBS, NBC, and ABC were in the heyday when there was no Fox, no CNN, no internet, no talk radio, no right-wing talk radio, nothing. Three big channels providing you with the news in segments every night, and everybody in the United States watched these three big channels all presenting a basically leftist perspective. And you could have read the newspaper instead of watching TV, but then you got the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune, the LA Times, all basically left-wing, just the same as they are today. And what alternatives did you have if you wanted something else? You could sign up for a newsletter. But that was it. There was one voice in this country. That's when media had power. What the internet has done, it has demolished that power. You think social media is more powerful. Social media makes it less powerful. It grants you access to anything you want. Now, it turns out most Americans want, or many Americans want, conspiracy theories and pseudoscience, but you can get whatever you want. By the way, it's ironic, but Trump, Donald Trump in his lawsuit, whoops, Donald Trump in his lawsuit, you know, Donald Trump is suing Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, I think. But Donald Trump in his lawsuit claims that these um, players, uh, uh, these social media companies, violated his First Amendment rights. Now, his lawyers know that private companies can't violate the First Amendment. So they're not really blaming the companies. What they are saying is that the First Amendment rights were violated because Democrats put pressure on social media to dump Trump. Social media wouldn't have done it if not for political pressure from political, from political party, that is from government. Again, ironic, coming from Trump, who used political power, at least used the threat of political power, constantly. It's unlikely he's going to win this lawsuit, partially because if you're going to sue anybody, if, you, if you're claiming the government put pressure on Twitter to get rid of you, who should you sue? Twitter? No, Twitter's the victim here. Who should you sue? The government. He should sue the Democrats. He should sue the Biden administration, claiming that they violated his First Amendment rights. 
He's not going to do that because I don't think he can prove his case. So it's unlikely. But it's going to be interesting to see if it ever goes to trial and how it's, uh, how it's going to play out. So Democrats now, not only is the Biden administration uh, screen, you know, suggesting, quote, to, to Facebook what they should and shouldn't post on the pandemic. Um, you know, Biden actually said that Facebook was killing people by allowing for, quote, misinformation. Now, notice that is a very dangerous step. Now you associate information with deaths, with physical force, with violence. That is, again, a path towards not allowing that speech, using government power to avoid that speech in the name of public safety. So the government is using the COVID crisis. Democrats are using the COVID crisis to basically come in and try to regulate speech that is occurring on private platforms. It's truly sickening. Even though, I mean, yeah, most of the stuff that I think they're flagging is misinformation probably is misinformation. Not the government's job. Not what government does. That is your responsibility to figure out whether what you take seriously is misinformation or not. Not to be told by others. Let's see. Um, by the way, a number of states, uh, Republican-controlled states, uh, are uh, in the different processes of passing laws to restrict the ability of um, Twitter, Facebook, and other social media to uh, exclude politicians from their platforms, to take them off, which is interesting. We live in a, we live in a country... Where we're all created equal. Why are politicians special? Florida has already passed this bill, right? We'll see. I think it'll be ruled unconstitutional, but Florida's already passed this bill where it's illegal, according to the state of Florida, for, for, for uh, Twitter to exclude politicians from their platform. I mean, they can exclude you, they can exclude me. Politicians, they're special. How did we get to the point in this country where politicians are special? There are servants with the special ones. Texas is considering bills like this. Iowa is considering bills like this. There's a variety of different bills in state legislatures trying to go after social media. But some of the scariest stuff is coming out of Democrats in the House and the Senate. So on Thursday of last week, Democratic senators introduced a bill to hold Facebook, YouTube, and other social media companies responsible for the proliferation of falsehoods about vaccines, fake cures, and other harmful health-related claims on their website. Now listen to this. Listen to this title. And you tell me if this is not one of the scariest things you've ever seen in American politics. It's called the Health Misinformation Act. The Health Misinformation Act. Now, as far as I know, it's the government that's been responsible for most of the health misinformation over the last 50, 60 years. Isn't it the government's view of saturated fat that has been misinformed? Isn't it the government's view of grains and sugars and other stuff that's being misinformed. The Health Misinformation Act targets a provision of Section 230, Trump and Republicans' favorite section, which protects platforms from being held liable for what they use as post in most cases. The bill would strip the companies of that legal shield in their, algor in their algorithms, if their algorithms, promote health misinformation during a public health crisis. Who defines a public health crisis? The government. Who defines what 
misinformation is. The government. Now, they have to be careful for free speech rights, so it doesn't apply if the misinformation is shown in chronological field. It's only if the algorithm is somehow promoting this. But the, everything is run by an algorithm. Information is not just provided free of an algorithm. The legislation leaves that up to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, a completely neutral science-based organization, which is responsible for declaring public health emergencies to define what constitutes health misinformation. It's truly scary and unbelievable that this is even under consideration in the United States Senate. I don't think this could pass the legal system unless it was so narrowly focused on Section 230 that somehow it got away with it. It would just open up these companies to liability. But to a large extent, opening these companies to liability for these kind of things has the potential of destroying their business model completely. Of course, this article goes on to say, you remind us that on Friday, President Biden said social platforms are killing people, although he later walked it back and said he meant that the people who spread misinformation about vaccines are irresponsible. Yes, but isn't it the people who post this stuff, the people who make these claims that are irresponsible? It's not the job of social media to make those calls for us. You don't like what people are saying. You think it's damaging? Sue them. See how far you get in that with court, in court. So instead of suing the person who's doing the misinformation, let's threaten the social media companies so that they do your censoring for you. YouTube is going to restrict even more health advice from non-authoritative sources. It's going to elevate in its search requests uh, uh, videos from authoritative sources. Who gets aside? What's an authority? says, the law, which was intended to promote online speech and allow online services to grow. This is Senator Amy Klobuchar, one of the so-called better Democrats. Now it distorts legal incentives for platforms to respond to digital misinformation on critical health issues like COVID-19 and leaves people who suffer harm with, no, no, with little to no recourse. They can still sue the person who posted it. And isn't the person who reads this the one responsible? Are we all so dumb, assumed to be so dumb, as we just read everything on these bulletin boards, on these uh, social media platforms, and it's their responsibility, not ours, for screening it? I just have to, I, just a side comment, because this is, this, is, this is such garbage. Han says, do you really think the poor people that died in the building deserved it because they weren't proactively monitoring the structure? I never said that. You should actually learn to listen to what people say. And if, you're not, if, you, if you don't know, before you make accusations like this, maybe write down what people say. What I said was that to the extent that they were warned that the building was dangered, and they were warned by several people over three years, to the extent that they refused to heed the warnings, make the changes necessary in order to fix the building, to the extent that they evaded the knowledge that their building was in danger, even though engineer after engineer and if the engineer told them so, to that extent, they don't deserve it. They suffered the consequences of their own decisions. That's what I said. I said it's right that the people who make the decisions suffer the consequences. Not that somebody else suffered the consequences of bad decisions. 
And since this is a condo building in which the residents of that condos are owners and are therefore the people who made the decision to evade, to ignore the warnings, they didn't deserve to die. Nobody deserves to die in that context. But they suffer the consequences of their own bad decisions. Now, that's very different than saying that they deserved it because they weren't proactive. They didn't. It wasn't an issue proactively. They were told. And, and actually, what's his name? Seda, Sam Seda, said during the show, they were told. They were warned. They were warned. That's exactly what Sam Seda said to me. And I said, if they were warned and they made the decision not to do anything about it, and they, then they suffer the consequence of their own decisions, which is better than you suffering consequence of somebody else's decisions. Come on, people. Well, people trusted relatives that it was a good place to, to stay. It's sad that they died. There were children there who don't deserve to die. I would never say people deserve to die. But the fact is, when you make horrible decisions, innocent people are going to suffer. And most of the people who died were the ones, unfortunately, who made the bad decisions. But you see, Sam wants to say, no, we should have government regulations and government controls to make sure that people don't make these bad decisions. And my point is, my point is that in this case, the majority of the people who suffered are the people who made the bad decisions. And yes, innocents died as well. Innocents always die. In a, bad stuff always happens when people make bad decisions. But you claim you're trying to be fair, but you're not being fair, right? You throw out a sentence like that. You throw out an accusation like that on a chat. Luckily, I caught it, and I can, I can respond. But you throw accusations like that on a chat. People who might not have context now think that I am just, I think they deserve to die. I never said that. It would be bizarre for me to say something like that. So it, it, it's unbelievably frustrating that people twist the words that you say, twist them to make you seem as evil and as horrific as possible. For what? What's the purpose of that? What's the purpose of that? To make you look as evil and horrific as possible. There's no positive. There's no benevolent interpretation of this. All right. Told you I'd get angry today. Anyway, so look, while it could be that Section 230 needs reforming, this is what's going to happen if you reform it. It's the left that's going to get in there. Now, many legal scholars are claiming that even if you got rid of Section 230, no court would hold the social media companies liable, liable, for something some jerk posted that had misinformation in it. That indeed, the courts would protect their First Amendment right. So even without Section 230, all you would do with removing Section 230, in my view, is create massive numbers of lawsuits. And you would probably create social media that became defensive, became more like a publisher, and restricted our ability to post Anything that wasn't plain vanilla, you'd actually get less interesting speech, less diversity, less conflict, less controversy. Now, no, Stephen, thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Note that Republicans are pushing this as well. Headline from CNBC. House Republicans outline principles for reforming Section 230. What are the principles? Limiting the right of tech companies to exclude users based on their viewpoints of political affiliation. How is that not violating their free speech? To exclude who they want to exclude. To keep who they want to keep. Isn't that part of what free speech protects? Requiring reasonable modera moderation practices to address harms like illegal drug sales and child exploitation. Who gets to decide what reasonable is? 
Which one? Which congressman? Which senator? Who gets to make that decision? Narrowing protected moderation to specific types of speech not protected by the First Amendment. Why are there, what speech is not protected by the First Amendment? Shouldn't under those circumstances? So, oh, I guess this, what this says is you can ban people only if they engage in speech not protected by the First Amendment. But you're violating then the free speech rights of the platforms themselves. Removing protection for discriminatory moderation decision based on viewpoints. Do you really want to go there? Do you really want to bring discrimination law into social media? It's going to be discrimination of viewpoints. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure the left is going to have a field day with that. That all these social media companies are discriminating against the left. Or against gays, or against trans, or against fill in the blank of the oppressed group. These are Republicans who want to now control the speech of these social media companies. Now, note, too, that these laws that the Republicans would like to pass only apply, they say, to big tech companies with annual revenues of one billion or more. Where's the equality before the law? Where is it? Where's the equality before the law? Only big companies we're going to regulate, only big companies. That's bad enough that we have antitrust laws. Now we're going to impose laws about speech, but only if you're big. If you're small, you can do whatever the hell you want, but if you're big, the government is going to control your speech. The government is going to tell you what's appropriate and what's inappropriate to speak. It's, I mean, I get it the Democrats are doing this, but the Republicans are doing it. Trump did it. And now it's just the idea of, 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 of the freedom to speech, the freedom to decide who to post and who not to post, what ideas you want affiliated with your website and what ideas you don't want affiliated with your website. That's going to hell. That's being pounded away by both sides of the political aisle. I mean, this is the headline. Why Republicans and even a couple of Democrats want to throw our tech's favorite law. That's another headline from another publication, right? Republicans and Democrats both want to repeal part of digital content law, but experts say that will be extremely tough. Yeah. Now, again, maybe 230 needs to be rewritten, but do you trust these guys to rewrite it? Do you trust 230 to protect free speech or to violate free speech if the Democrats and Republicans of today, if Elizabeth Warren and Josh Hawley get to sit down and decide what's going to be in the law, is that what you want? I would rather take 230 as it is, even if it could be improved, than to let these people dabble with it. And then on top of that, now you've got every special interest in the world wanting to regulate social media. Uh, on the left, it's organizations like Change of, uh, Color of Change, Anti-Defamation League, Common Sense Media. What do they want? They want social media to stop with hate speech. Hate speech. Bring those European laws to America. We do even a worse job with them. All right. It's just unbelievable how, how bad things are. How bad things are because, yes, we've got a Democrat in the White House, we've got an awful Democrat in the White House, White House who isn't even coherent. He can't even finish sentences. 
we've got Democrats that have clearly been pulled and shifted out to the left. And then we've got Republicans who are not an opposition party. They just want to restrict different speech than the left does in different ways slightly. Although they all want to go after the same target. They all want to go after big tech in one way or another. Left and right are completely united about this. Completely united about this. And the consequence of that is our rights are being violated. And we are in a real risk right now to lose the protection of speech. It's already happening stealthily with government influencing, suggesting, recommending. Once you do that, it's all downhill. Once you accept that, once you shrug at that, once you don't care about that, and if you combine it with the fact that there's no opposition party when it comes to these fundamental issues, there's nobody standing up for the rights of individuals. There's nobody standing up for inalienable rights. There's nobody standing up for free speech, for actual free speech. There's no, I don't know where you can get hope, where that hope can come from. And this is why we have to fight all of them, the left and the right. We have to fight them all. We have to fight the bad ideas wherever they are. If we're the last people standing and defending free speech, then we need to be the ones defending free speech. And if that means we need to fight Democrats and Republicans, Republicans and Democrats, then so be it. That's our responsibility. That's our job. All right. And it's, um, I don't know. I, you know, there's nobody, it, it, it depresses me that there's really nobody out there. Nobody out there. Oh, very, very few people out there. Very few people out there that are, that are fighting the right fight. And it's not for Section 230. It's for everybody in America's right to speak, to decide what they want to print, what they don't want to print, what they want to endorse, what they don't want to endorse. Everybody should have that right. And again, maybe there are ways to improve 230. But don't give it to this gang of fools, to this group of statists who are almost suddenly going to make things worse, not better. All right, so before we go on, um, and I'm going gonna, gonna to go to quickly to a, a topic that will keep me really pissed off. Um, before we go on, let me just um, encourage everybody to use the Super Chat support the show. Um, we've, got, we've got an ambitious target today. It's, it's, some, it's, it's north of 400. Uh, hopefully we can get significantly north of 400. We, we're going to have fewer shows this month. I'm still trying to because I'm traveling. And I'll be traveling to Israel in the UK next week and the week after that. So we're trying to get up to uh, to uh, $5,000 um, for the month. For that, we need about 1200 bucks today to get there. So, uh, well, today and tomorrow. So we could do less than 1200 but the combined total should be 1200 So let's see how far we can go. It would be great. Some of you have stepped in with $100 uh, contributions. I really, really appreciate that. Thank you again, Stefan, and thank you again. Ragnar of the Desert, who've done $100, and a bunch of you have put in uh, $20 questions uh, and uh, $50, $50 Canadian. And so we've got a lot of, a lot of kind of uh, uh, good-sized um, good contributions. But we still need more of your support, so uh, I'm going to keep bugging you about it uh, until we get closer to where we need to be. But, and I will get to all these, uh, all these questions soon. Um, all right, so... You know, that's my spiel on that. I, you know, uh, of course, there are, um, 
I, I've done talks on free speech. If you want to understand uh, the full uh, implication, the, the, the necessity of, of, of free speech and why it's so essential to Western civilization, to civilization, period, then you can look up some of my talks uh, on various, uh, on, on YouTube here. Just put your own book, Free Speech, and, and I've got several talks there that you can, uh, that you can look at. Uh, but this is, this is an important topic to get educated on. This is an important topic to, uh, to get passionate about and to, to be fighting. And if right now all we need to do is fight the left and fight, uh, fight, uh, what's his name? Biden and the Democrats and Soviet. It's, this is a topic worthy of fight. It's it, worthy of every ounce of fight that we have. Thank you, Wayne. I really appreciate that. That's great. So we're over 400. So uh, we've made Ali's goal. Now we need to go for my goal. So we've still got 800 bucks to go to get to mine. Um, <laughs> if somebody wants to get us a shortcut there, that would be great. $80? No, $800, Allie. What's 80? 80 would get us to 500. We're trying to get it 1200. All right. I want to, I want to, uh, do these two movie reviews. We've got two movies to review. One, the shows, but has paid me to review. So we have to get to that. That's once upon a time in Hollywood. And the other one is the outpost, uh, which I wanted, I saw last night and I really wanted to talk to you about, I, I, I like, as soon as the movie ended, I, I, I wanted to get on and, and yell into the microphone. Um, I mean, I highly, let me say this, I highly recommend the movie. It's very unenjoyable, but it's an important movie. I was so angry. I was so infuriated by this movie. Um, I, you know, I was in tears at the end of it from anger and frustration and, and, and just upset at the sheer evil that this movie reveals. Now, the movie's based on a true story. I think it's, it's made very well, particularly when you get into the action scenes, the actual battle. It's a true story of an outpost in Afghanistan in 2006, I think. It's, uh, it's an outpost in Afghanistan that is constantly attacked by the Taliban. Uh, and ultimately, there's a big battle between the Taliban and the American forces. And, and I have to say, the battle is very well done, very engaging, very suspenseful. Uh, the horror of war, the, the, uh, but also the, 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 the movie's really focused on the, the amazing heroism of, of these soldiers. So I think it's in 50 years, um, I think this is the battle where more soldiers, or maybe it's the unit where more soldiers received medals of honor, different, different medals from it than, um, than any other. So, so these guys were unbelievably heroic and they, they fought for each other and they tried to save each other's lives and they um, just heart-wrenching and well done and well developed. Now, why then am I so angry? <sighs> the South Post was put in the middle of nowhere in order to help cultivate the villages of Afghanistan, to try to buy their love away from the Taliban. The outpost was there in order to invest in infrastructure and schools and bribing the local chiefs to buy, as the movie repeatedly says, their hearts and minds so that they would oppose the Taliban. Americans are there not to defend America, not to defend American values, not to defend America, Americans' rights, property, lives. They're there I don't know what they're there for. That they're under doctrine, a doctrine promoted by people like General Petraeus, General McChrystal. McChrystal is actually identified in the movie as a source of some of this stuff. These generals that people on right and left hail as heroes. 
So in the movie, there's a scene in which the Taliban is shooting down at the base from the hills. And the soldiers that are being shot upon have to ask for permission to shoot back. And when they ask for permission, they're asked, can you identify the person shooting at you? You can't just shoot in the direction because you might hit civilians. You cannot defend yourselves, in other words. And they were lectured upon that this is what General McChrystal has told them. These are the generals that our society, our world, elevates to godlike status, particularly among Republicans. Buying the hearts and minds of Afghans to hell with American kids, to hell with their lives. Commander after commander at this outpost are killed by the Taliban. And repeatedly, the soldiers are told, you can't do anything about it. We have to be nice. We can't do anything about it. You have to be nice to the people here, because if you get tough, you'll lose the hearts and minds. And we got to buy the hearts and minds, because if we do, that's how we'll defeat the Taliban. And the Afghans keep telling them, this one Afghan keeps telling them, you know, the Taliban is coming for you. Now, here's what really, really, really pissed me off. Again, true story. Apollo Zeus, thank you. The outpost is in basically at the bottom, surrounded by mountains. At some point, one of the soldiers says, aren't we supposed to be at the top of the mountain? Why are we at the bottom? Surrounded by places where the Taliban can shoot down at them, unharmed. Snipers can just shoot at them at will. Luckily, Taliban have no sophisticated weapons, so most of it's just firing. No watch, no defensive strategy, clearly placing this outpost in a position where they can only suffer casualties, where they can only die, where it's indefensible and are not provided with the kind of support to make it possible for them to defend themselves. Never mind win, never mind beat the enemy, but defend themselves. These soldiers are basically placed naked and depend on chance and on luck in order to survive. It's disgusting that the military hierarchy in America would do such a thing. Why? So we can build some roads for the Afghans. At some point, the Afghans being a body of a young woman to the base and say, you guys killed her. And the Americans all know that they didn't kill her, that the Taliban killed her. But the Afghans bring the body because they know that if they accuse the Americans of killing her, the Americans will give them money. So the commander says, give him 3,500 bucks. And the soldier says, but we didn't do it. He says, doesn't matter. This will buy us peace. No, this buys you weakness. This creates the perception of weakness. I mean, this is much worse than Benghazi for a number of reasons. Partially because this is, this is so obviously callous. This is so obviously uncaring of the lives of our children, uncaring of the lives of those Americans who volunteered to go fight for our values, for our defense of our country. And they're the ones who deserve protection. They're the ones who deserve the best equipment. They're the ones who deserve the rules of engagement that, that place their interests first and foremost. And yet they're told their lives are expendable. And for what? What are they dying for? I mean, we're leaving Afghanistan now, so it's, it's, it's the context is perfect. What the hell are they dying for? To buy the hearts and minds of people who don't want their hearts and minds bought by you? To squander American dollars? American dollars that fall into the enemy's hands, they just use to buy weapons to kill more American kids? I mean, you can understand a battle where you're fighting for something, where there's liberty at stake, where there's freedom at stake, where you're, 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 the way of living is at stake, where you're defending rights. But this is a battle you have got, 
you, you're going to lose in Afghanistan without any question, particularly in this one outpost, where you're given rules of engagement that make it impossible for you to win, and where you're fighting for nothing, nothing. And indeed, bringing the troops back home right now illustrates that so powerfully, and this movie was so powerful in that context, because all those kids, and several of them, many of them, died in the battle and before the battle in this outpost. Good kids. What'd they die for? What was their life snuffed out for? So some general could write his dissertation, this is Petraeus, about how to do a counterinsurgency. And nobody cares. That's the thing that really pisses me off. The thing that really, really, really pisses me off is that nobody cares. Nobody stands up to defend these soldiers. Nobody speaks out for them. They're just treated as sacrificial lambs, and nobody gives a damn. Not Democrats, not Republicans, not civil rights people, not anti... Nobody. They just die. They volunteered to die, so they volunteered to the army, so who cares? But the movie, it's so obvious that the people in charge don't care. At some point, one of the sergeants reviewing, looking at the field, he says, yeah, I mean, the Taliban's going to overrun us, and if they do, this is what I would do. This is how I would attack us. We can't defend ourselves. We just can't. It doesn't matter how many weapons we have. We can't do it. But even though they know this, nothing is done about it. And as a consequence, I don't know, a dozen kids, some officers die for no reason, many of them injured. Now again, the heroism of the soldiers, the ability to survive, the ones who do survive, is truly stunning. I mean, imagine yourself in those circumstances. Go watch the movie. Watch the movie. And tell me that you don't get tears in your eyes at the end and you don't get furious at what is going on there. And, and it sold. This movie did well in the box office. Uh, you know, it came out last year under COVID, so it, it was released a video on demand, but it was one of the best-selling video on demand movies last year. And where was the uproar? Where was the disgust? And this is 2006. How many hundreds of Americans have died since then pursuing the same losing goals, the same sacrifice for nothing. All right, this is the movie The Outpost. I recommend it. It's very well done, particularly the battle scenes, but it's super, super depressing and very violent, although not gory violent, just violent, violent. Um, and it's um, just outrageous that this is America. This is America? Not, not the America I thought we were. I thought at least people cared. You know? <sighs> yeah, one of Freeman says he will never watch it. <laughs> all right. Um, all right, I think I'm done being angry. Unless there's some questions that get me going again. So the last movie you reviewed, Shazbad, I don't know if he's still here. Um, this is uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Uh, this is a movie of, this is a, one of Quint, Quentin Tarantino's movies. Um, it is, uh, it is uh, you know, whereas The Outpost has um, very few actors that I really uh, were familiar to me. Uh, a lot of young actors, a lot of, I guess, new actors. Uh, the Quentin Tarantino movie is just packed full of the most fa famous actors in the world. I mean, I don't know if you've seen this movie, but it's got Leonardo DiCaprio, Brad Pitt, uh, Margaret Robbie, uh, Emile Hirsch. It's got, you know, Dakota Fanning. Al Pacino even makes an appearance. It's just everywhere. So I generally don't like Tarantino movies. And just, I'll tell you up front, I don't like this one either. I don't like Tarantino movies because they don't have a plot. 
They don't have a plot. They have just vignettes that are tied together by chance or randomly. Certainly in this movie, it's chance, fate, randomness. And I don't find the characters appealing or interesting or particularly fascinating. This is a movie, and I'm not going to give the whole thing away, but it, it takes a, a very tragic event in Hollywood history and provides an alternative ending for it. It provides uh, an ending that is a happier ending. But for no good reason, just because there's no reason why it should end this way. There's no reason why it should be this way. It's just that Quentin Tarantino wanted to be like this. I'd say the best part about the movie, I mean, it's well acted, but the photography, the kind of the way Tarantino makes his movies is, is just showmanship and pretentiousness and, and, you know, camera angles just to be cool and to be like others. So the best thing about this movie, the best thing about this movie, I mean, Glorious Best is the same way. It has no plot. It's just vignettes. Yeah, bad guys get blown up, but there's nothing, there's no point to it. There's no message. There's no logical conclusion. There's nothing. I mean, Reservoir Dogs is a complete story. I, I liked uh, the one, the only one of his I liked, I didn't like Reservoir Dogs, super violent. And just again, what's the point of the whole thing? The one I liked was, um, oh, the slavery one, um, um, which I thought was the, the best of the best of his movies. But the best thing about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood Jackie Brown, I haven't seen yet. It has been recommended to me. Vignettes, short stories, but, you know, short stories, short stories. Anyway, scenes unrelated. Django Unchained. Django Unchained was probably my favorite Tarantino movie um, that I've seen so far. But I haven't seen Jackie Brown, and Jackie Brown comes highly recommended by somebody I trust with regard to movies. The, I think the, the thing about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood that is most fun and I think was the fun part of making it from the perspective of Tarantino is its you know, insight, insight a look at Hollywood in the, what is it, uh, early 1970s. It's a tribute to uh, the, the dying days of the Western. It's a certain tribute to a certain type of actor and a certain style of Hollywood. You know, even the way he shoots the camera scenes, in particular scenes, are tributes to particular directors. He got into trouble with Bruce Lee's family because there's a scene in which he makes fun of Bruce Lee. Right? But it's, it's kind of all an insider joke, a Hollywood insider joke, Hollywood insider tribute. Well, Cook says he only likes Quentin Tarantino movies since Kill Bill, but Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is after Kill Bill. So you're saying you like this movie. That's possible. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm, you have to like movies that I like. I'm telling you why I did not like it. No plot in any of his movies. I didn't like Pulp Fiction, pretentious, gimmicky. Um, yeah, <laughs> I mean, there was some originality in it. I think a lot of the way he shoots his movies, he's imitating European directors. Um, but uh, the acting is good. There's certain fun to see all these actors in the same movie. If you know like spaghetti westerns and if you know the westerns of the 1960s, his kind of tribute to them is is fun. But it's not... A good movie. It doesn't come together. It doesn't have anything to say that's interesting. And it doesn't have a plot that's interesting. It, it it's mainly boring. It's mainly boring. Yeah, I mean uh, Frank says Cohen Brothers are way more original. Yeah, I, I think they are. I like I like Cohen Brothers movies much more than I like Quentin Tarantino movies. Cohen, um, I mean again, not all of them, but I do like a lot of Cohen Brothers movies. Quentin Tarantino just strikes me as being too clever and manipulative for his own good. 
for example. Um, what else can I say about uh, the movie? I mean, you've got like a lot of movies. It's it's focused on a couple of losers. You know, a stunt man who who has nothing in his life, nothing except doing stunts for this one cowboy character. The cowboy character whose career is dying. Both of them are going nowhere. Both of them are nowhere and are going nowhere. And it's just uninteresting and random. And I, I you know, I want to be, I want to be moved in a movie. Like the outpost, I was moved. I was moved to outrage. I was moved to tears, but I was moved by it. I want to be inspired by a movie. If I'm not moved, then, you know. Or I want to find a movie that's interesting. <laughs> Troy, thank you, man. That's great. Really, really appreciate that. That's for Rules for Life number six. Thank you. Rules for Life number seven is coming, is coming. I, I also need to find topics for these Rules of Life. I never thought I'd do so many Rules of Life for Life. I thought there'd be three shows and that's it. So I, I need to come up with rules. <laughs> if anybody has ideas for rules, let me know. Uh, but number, number seven will be coming up in the next uh, week or so, if I can do a show from Israel. But thank you, Troy. Uh, love the support. I want to I wanna have a character in the movie that I want to follow, even if I don't like him or, or I don't like all of him, even if he's flawed, that I care about him that I, and I, and I want to know what happens to him and I see a path for him. Didn't see it here. Rules for Life are shows that I do called Iran's Rules for Life. And I've done six of them. You can look them up. I'll create a playlist soon with all of them together. Uh, but it's basically the applying, I'd say, the objectivist ethics to the best of my ability, applying them to your lives, my life, how to apply them, specific concrete recommendations and suggestions for you. I think people are getting a lot out of them. They definitely draw a small audience. So that's why I really appreciate it when people like Troy really support the shows and, and get behind them because the fact is that fewer people watch them. Uh, so they don't do quite as well on the YouTube algorithms. Um, I just think people are much more interested in political shows, sadly, I think, uh, than, in, uh, than these other shows. Maybe I just don't, you know, we'll see. I'm, I'm glad Troy and others are enjoying them. Uh, Stefan, uh, thanks for answering. Sure. Thanks for the support. All right, let's, um, let's see. Shazbot, anything in particular you want to raise about the movie? I mean, you put a lot of money on me watching it, so I want to make sure that I cover, I cover uh, all the bases here. So... Um, you know, we'll keep trying to find a movie that both Shazbot and I like. I assume he asked me to cover it because he likes the movie. I don't know. I, I shouldn't really judge him on that. But uh, anyway. Anyway, we're at 850 bucks, guys. That is great. That is phenomenal. 350 more to go. And uh, we're, at the, we're, we're done with a month. We're done with a month. I, I, can, I can lay low the rest of the month or, 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 or bug you less the rest of the month. Okay, let's see. Let's take some Super Chat questions um, that, uh, why did we cover this movie? Which one? Uh, Once Upon a Time in the West, in Hollywood, we did because uh, somebody paid me to cover it. Charles Bart did. Um, he says, of the three options I gave you, I was expecting you to select The Wind Rises. Maybe I should have given you that one, The Wind Rises. I, um, I don't know that one. So... Um, I'll, I'll check it out. I'll check it out. I wanted to, I wanted to see Once Upon a Time in Hollywood because it was, because it was such a, it, it was so talked about. It was so, um, you know, it was, it was part of the, the, the news cycle. It was part of the culture. So I'm glad, I'm glad I got to watch it. But you know what? Given how much you've done in terms of supporting my movie reviews, I'll, I'll look for The Wind Rises and maybe on this trip overseas, I'll try to watch it and do a review, review of it. Um, so if I, can, if I can get on one of the, if you know 
where I can find it, like Netflix or Prime or something like that, let me know and I'll download it for the, uh, for the flight. Okay, let's do some of the $50 ones. Uh, Arthur asks, um, you being to the Republic of Georgia, have you ever heard of classical concert pianist Katya Bunitishvili? Talented, passionate when she performs, beautiful. Several CDs out along with hours of her performances on YouTube. I have seen her on YouTube. Um, I haven't seen her in Georgia, but I have seen her on YouTube. And um, she is beautiful. And uh, she's very passionate when she performs. And I think she's quite good. I, you know, it's hard, particularly because it's YouTube, so the sound quality is so, so. It's hard for me to tell how great, a, how good of a piano she is and, and how significant, particularly because she's so popular on YouTube. One has to ask the question, how much of it is that because she's beautiful and she looks sexy and everything, and how much of it is the ability and the piano. But um, YouTube, remember, is a male... Um, is a, is a platform that, that is dominated by men. But uh, I want to get a CD of hers and, and uh, where I can get the real high-quality music and, uh, and listen to it. Um, but there are a lot of really good musicians coming out of that part of the world. Um, there's a number of good musicians out of the Republic of Georgia. There, uh, I saw a pianist in... Um, oh, Shazbot, thank you. Thank you. All right. I'll do the wind rises. Thank you. Right, we're, we're getting very close to 1,200. Um, I, I, I was at a performance of Rachmaninoff, I think second piano concerto, or maybe it was the third, I can't remember, in London a couple of years ago with an Uzbekistani pianist from Uzbekistan. And he was fantastic, fantastic. So there was a culture of classical music in the former Soviet republics um, that is still alive and well, and uh, still oh, alive, not still, is alive and well, and uh, results in, um, you know, great performers, and, 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 um, and it's exciting to watch. Pianists, violinists, and so on. Okay, $30. Arthur Renee asks, is there any point in attending university nowadays unless for STEM field subjects? I mean, it depends on the university. Uh, you could go to Clemson University and, and, and be part of the um, Lyceum Scholar Program and get a classical education there. There are other places in which you could study the classics. You could study history with great historians. Uh, there are places where you could study good economics, George Mason, um, Clemson again, a few other places. So uh, it really depends, finance, business. Um, I, you can't just throw out all of university because some departments a truly garbage, a truly, truly bad. Uh, you've got to really evaluate the particular university, what you want to study and what you want to get out of the experience. But there's still knowledge to be gained in universities as bad as they are. There's certain universities to avoid. There's certainly certain fields to avoid. Certain fields to avoid. All right. Um, Thomas Schubert says, uh, would love to discuss American self-interest with you. To what extent do our interests involve being willing to use military force to make the world a certain way? Do we need to be the world's policemen? No, absolutely not. Americans' self-interest is the self-interest of Americans vis-a-vis -vis the government. The only thing the government is there to do vis-a-vis -vis our self-interest is to protect our rights from thieves, foreign thieves, in this case, foreign policy, from foreign invasion, from foreign terrorists, from foreigners trying to kill us or steal our stuff. So, um, so self-interest in this context is for the government to do its job. And its job is to protect our rights, that's it. So no, we should not be the policemen of the world, we should not go around the world and, and make it in our image, we should not go around the world to defend other people's freedoms and to bring democracy to the world or to bring real freedom to the world or whatever it is. We should focus on the lives and property of Americans and defending those. That's hard enough. And that would require you to go to war once in a while. But rarely, very rarely, most of the wars we've done since World War II were completely unnecessary. Most of the wars we got into before World War II 
were completely unnecessary. And Ayn Rand thought even World War II was unnecessary. Not sure I agree with her on that one. Yep. All right, let's see. Um, so that's my view of self-interest. Quickly, I've, of course, I've written, whole, I've written articles about it. I've written books about it. Um, you, you can check them out. My writings on American foreign policy, particularly in Ilan Giorno's Winning the Unwinnable War. I have three essays there that I think lay out pretty thoroughly my position about foreign policy and war, particularly, uh, particularly um, with regard to the war on terrorism, but more broadly, I think the principles are there. So uh, I, I highly recommend to all of you reading Winning the Unwinnable War. You can get it on Amazon. Uh, edited by Lan Giorno with three essays by myself, co-authored with Ilan and with Alex Epstein. Epstein. Um, all right. Uh, this question is from Israel. Hi, Iran. I've listened to your lectures about Israel and your talks with Ilan Giorno, and I try to look at the Israeli-Palestinian conflict through the lens of freedom and individualism. I try to ask myself what each side is fighting for. And you can say that Israel is fighting for free Western value-based society in general. But my problem is with those within Israel, Israel who are not pro-freedom. May they be Masonic settlers that believe that the land was given to them by God, or the Hasidic Jews or the nationalist collectivist right-wingers. How can I defend Israel in this conflict with their groups within Israel that are not pro-freedom? Is freedom a question of relativity or the lesser of evil? Thank you for your great content. Well, certainly, we don't have a purely free society in the world today. But it's not so much an issue of the lesser of evils, because Israel, and in this case the Palestinians, or most other Arab countries, are not on the same scale of freedom. Israel is a basically free country. Flawed, mixed economy but, you know, respects the fundamentals. You, you choose your political party, you choose who, who, who governs, and you have free speech. Now, and, and, and there's respect for property rights, to the extent that anybody respects today property rights, and the rule of law, and contracts. And then you have uh, Arab regimes that are clearly barbaric, and, and don't respect any of those things. So it is a, it's, it's a clear-cut difference. Israel is on the scale of freedom, maybe not so free on the scale of freedom. You could be a lot freer, and Israel should be criticized for not being free enough. But the Arab world is on a different scale. It's on the scale of authoritarianism. It's on the scale of lack of freedom. And therefore, one is good and one is evil. Maybe, you know, you could decide what, where the Palestinians are on the scale of evil, and you can decide on the scale of good where Israel is. But they're two different scales. Two different scales. So that's why you defend Israel. And at the same time, you have to say, just like in any free country, there are people in America who are anti-freedom on the right and on the left. And there are people in Israel who are anti-freedom on the right and on the left. And there are better people among the Palestinians. They just have no political power and no voice. If they do have a voice, it's silenced by their own people. So you've got to be critical of the bad within Israel while defending the fact that it fundamentally has these freedoms. It's fundamentally a Western culture. And that it's fighting barbarism. It's not fighting just a little bit less free or a little bit more free. No, once free, one is not in comparison. Okay. When you were giving lectures on free speech after the Charlie Hebdo shooting, Jax asks, did you ever think it would be get as bad as it is today in the US? No, I didn't. That was 2015, January, I think, 2015. And I did not think it would get this bad. This is before Trump was elected. Trump was a shock to the system. And, it's, and, and this is what I said, he made everybody worse. He made everybody worse. He made the right worse, much worse, and he made the left worse, much worse. And I think that's his legacy in American politics. He's made everybody worse. 
No, he's not a shock to me. He's a shock to the entire American political system. And he's, he, 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 again, he made the Republicans and the right much worse, statist, much more authoritarian. Didn't expose the left. He did nothing to expose the left. The left was always what the left is. And the left became worse. And the left became emboldened by Trump. Emboldened by Trump. Because much of what they had advocated for years, Trump embraced. Central planning, restrictions on free speech. Trump embraced much of the agenda of the left. Tariffs. Anyway, so um, I did not think it could be this bad, but... Uh, or put it another way, I thought it would be this bad, I just didn't think it would happen so quickly. This has happened much, much quickly than I ever thought it could. Um, John asked, yesterday the U.S. Embassy in Bosnia issued a statement on its website supporting a law criminalizing denying a genocide instead of condemning it. I mean, that is horrific. Horrific. And again, I, I don't think that's a, a party issue. You know, this is the kind of stuff that, that the kind of uh, uh, anti-free speech, uh, pro-anti-hate speech legislation. I mean, one of the first things Europe did on its long slide away from free speech is to criminalize Holocaust denial. Now, you all know I'm not a Holocaust denier, but somebody, anybody has a right to be one has a right to express that opinion. You have a right to ignore them. You even have a right to cancel them. You even have a right to drop them from your social media platform. But the government doesn't have a right to silence them. So it truly is horrible where we're heading. And that's a good example where the US would sanction a law that condemns genocide. In this case, genocide against, I guess, against Bosnians in particular. Yeah, even have a right to unfriend them, yes. Okay, John asks, I agree the government is the main driver of these assaults on free speech, but doesn't some of the blame fall on tech CEOs for not standing up for themselves and their companies? Yeah, but, you know, yes, tech CEOs should stand up for their companies and, and for themselves. I wish they would. But you still have to put the blame squarely on the people attacking them from which they won't stand up, right? And that blame needs to be on government, on politicians, who drag them in front of Congress. Now, yes, they should be doing a much better job defending themselves and defending their rights and, and explaining what they do and why they do it, or telling politicians to take a hike that it's none of their business. But they are not the primary blame. I blame all businessmen for not standing up. Ayn Rand said, she talked about the sanction of the victim. There was a massive sanction of the victim, sanction of the businessman, the victim of government. Bree asks, I had a video go viral and get 26,000 views. It is only 34 seconds long. I think YouTube is trying to compete with TikTok and short videos. You should try it. Maybe your rules or some uh, of your catchphrases from lectures. It's very hard for me to produce a short video. I, I can try. I tried for TikTok, and I, I just can't get motivated to stand here and do short videos. Uh, I mean, uh, Action Jackson has actually tried to create particularly short videos out of segments of these shows. I think he could take what I said about the building collapse in Miami and turned that into a two minute video. But it turns out that they don't do very well as compared to the longer videos. And I'd rather do longer videos because I'm trying to get an argument across. But it's very hard for me to get motivated. That's, that's the real issue. I, there's, there are lots of things I could probably be doing. Um, Diego Morales says, your aunt can't say hello in less than 10 minutes. I can't, say how, uh, I can't say hello in less than 10 minutes if I'm not motivated to do it. Believe me, some people, when I meet them, 
I'm very motivated to say hello in three seconds and get out of there. But I need to be motivated. So a lot of it's about motivation. All right. Um, can someone help sponsor for your own review? Sartre's No Exit, Camus the Stranger. We'll see if anybody steps up, Ruth. Uh, what's your view of, on existentialism? I, you know, I think it's a very, very flawed philosophy that does a lot of harm. It's, again, the kind of philosophy that places emotions above reason. It's fatalistic and, and, uh, and uh, deterministic and uh, just, just malevolent. Uh, I, I read um, Camus. And saw true when I was a teenager, everybody did. It was a hot thing in high school. But by then I'd read Ayn Rand and I could just couldn't get it. After reading Rand, they were so dull and so unconvincing and so malevolent, so dreary. I haven't, so I haven't read it in what 40 something years. Um, but that's my opinion of existentialism. Just not very good philosophy and not very pro-life. Pro Harrison writes, this is all I can do for the moment. I appreciate whatever you can do. But I'll keep reminding you until you get around to reviewing The Golden Age by John C. Wright. Uh, all right. I'll, uh, I'll keep... Uh, it's on my list, I think. I put, it, I, I put these things on a list for me, to do, uh, for me to do at some point. So I will... Maybe I will get to it one of these days. Oh, yeah, there it is. It's a trilogy. Um, science fiction. All right. Uh, Alec writes, um, what is the long-term strategy for winning the battle for ideas over religion, altruism, and collectivism? I mean, the long-term strategy is to get the ideas out there. The long-term strategy is to use whatever marketing ability we have, whatever mechanism we have to get people to engage in the ideas. If we have good ideas... The key then is to engage people with them because if, they, if they're unknown, if they never hear about them, then there's no opportunity for them to win. The only hope that good ideas have to win is to be participant in the debate. So the strategy is to get people to read Ayn Rand through a variety of different projects to increase readership of the books. The, 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 um, the strategy is to st stimulate audiences into engaging with the ideas by doing TV shows, by doing podcasts, by doing interviews, by doing things like this in order to get the ideas out there and to, to intrigue and um, provoke people into exploring these ideas more deeply. And then, uh, most importantly probably, the long-term strategy is to... History is changed by ideas. But ideas need messengers. And the messengers are the intellectuals. And the ideas that dominate the intellectual sphere are the ideas that win. We must dominate the intellectual sphere. To do that, we need intellectuals. So I think the, the most important strategy of all is the development of new intellectuals. And we're putting a lot of resources at the Ayn Rand Institute uh, to develop new intellectuals, to, 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 to get them out there, to... Uh, uh, for them to dominate the intellectual sphere over time uh, to promote the right ideas and to, and to help change the world. It's intellectuals, intellectuals, intellectuals. If you could have a thousand like me, or better than me, or in different fields than me, but just communicators out there writing, speaking, lecturing, doing YouTube stuff, podcasts, TikTok, whatever, but intellectual from an objectivist perspective, we win. We win. Tom Harrison says, years ago, you did a talk with comedian commentator Adam Carolla. Is it available anyway? It's available behind his paywall. He always put it in the paywall. He never put it up front. It wasn't particularly good, I don't think. I mean, I was fine. But he never really engaged. It's like he was so hesitant. He was so worried. It's as if somebody had said something about Ayn Rand and be careful and they're weird. 
and at the end he was really happy with it and he but you could tell the whole time he was guarded so i don't think the interview came out that well but it is behind the paywall somewhere so if somebody is a subscriber to um to adam carolla's um podcast let me know if it's still there but it should be what does it mean uh this is alex what does it mean to have your values reflected back to you through sex or otherwise and why is that a good well because our values often are very abstract very very difficult to concretize this is primarily the role of art but i think it's also the role of relationships and in relationships you get it the values that are reflected back on you um spiritual values and the, and the values that character values moral values and what it means that they're reflected back at you um for example you, you value um they're mirrored back at you so for example if somebody loves you and they look at you in a particular way that is a reflection through their eyes of something real about you that you can't get anywhere else you can get it through introspection but there's a lack of objectivity they hear you getting it through somebody else's eyes and and love does that love is saying somebody values me in a profound way now assuming they value you for the right reasons they value me for my values for the value i have as a living being and that's very powerful and then to the extent that they live your values say you value honesty or you value productiveness and they're super honest and amazingly productive you see these this person reflects my values in their life but they are they they they're showing you the example of what it is not just the abstract idea but a real life and not just an aesthetic experience but a real life example of what it is and but a lot of it is how they respond to you and this is what i think generates love and what feeds love is is if you do something good something valuable something significant and they see it and they respond to you because of that that you see the value of what you did not just through introspection you see it out there in the world in their response to you and that you can see in sex what happens in sex is in sex they're responding to who you are and what you are the full you the the, the everything that you entail and they are giving you pleasure and you're giving them pleasure and you're responding to each other in a loving incredibly visible way you're projecting your values onto your partner and your partner's projecting it onto you they're giving you visibility into what it what you are doing to them and the value you represent for them right for them so i mean that's something we're doing a whole show on because it's it's a complicated psychological issue thank ask can you possibly interview andy nego nego is that how you pronounce it about antifa potentially there's a long list of people i'd like to interview uh we'll see tom harrison um by definition in objectivism is obama or aoc evil yes i think they're both evil certainly uh, you know they're both evaders they're both irrational they're both power lusters and that would certainly count them both as evil uh have any units or mass broken the rules of engagement on mass broken the rules of engagement said screw you to the military and took their lives seriously i don't know it's not like they were going to advertise this my guess is yes but um my guess is then that the military tries to hide it to the extent that they can and what else happens i think is that because of the rules of engagement because of the frustration because they don't feel valued because they they interpret this as nobody cares about them often this leads soldiers to do things that are inappropriate like kill pre- prisoners for no reason torture them for no reason and 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 I, and i think that you can explain a lot of the really bad behavior of some units 
where they do it not in self-defense, but they do it as vengeance, if you will, as a consequence of the way they're being treated by their own commanders, by their own political leaders, by their own culture. Michael asks, what do you make of Rand Paul's back and forth with Dr. Fauci? He's suggesting Fauci should be in jail. I don't know. I mean, I really don't know. Uh, I, I'm not an expert on this. I mean, again, Amish, Adolja thinks that Dr. Fauci is basically a good guy. Um, I think Fauci is mixed. I think the, the, the main problem with Fauci is he's in government, and he's been in government a long time, and, and, and he's got the problems of government. Uh, I think Rand Paul is uh, grandstanding. Uh, you know, but Paul was right about s children in school. They should have been in school the whole time. But I, I, I don't trust Rand Paul. I used to like him a lot more, but I don't like him anymore. He, he abandoned his principles in, in defense of Trump. Um, so I, I don't know to what extent Rand Paul is doing this honestly and to what extent Rand Paul is grandstanding to appeal to, to a certain constituency. Um, so, uh, you know, hard for me to say. I haven't looked into the latest exchange. I probably, I probably should, and, and I probably will, and get back to you on it. All right, Ali reminds you about $109 to get to the $1,200 goal. I mean, the fact that we over $1,000 is amazing. Thank you, guys. And I'm sure that with this plus whatever we do tomorrow, we'll get to where I need. We get, we'll get to $1,200 over the two shows. So we're in good territory. So even if we don't make the $190, uh, we're good. But anyway, uh, Ru, Ru, Ru Downs writes, uh, you want to reach out to you about lab, lab bore. They review supplements that go unregulated by the FDA. Check it out. Yeah, I've, I've actually, um, I've used lab bore for years now. Uh, it's a really phenomenal website. Um, they review, um, they basically review supplements. Supplements are not regulated by the FDA. I mean, they are in some ways, but they're not. They're not for the most part. Um, and Labo does a good job checking to see if the contents are really what's on the label, checking to see how pure the contents are. I don't know that they do like side effects and what, a, what you know, d does it really do what's promised? I don't think they do that kind of research. But at least they make sure that what you're buying is really what you think you're buying. And then they tell you which are the best in terms of purity and in terms of, in terms of uh, you know, uh, truth of labeling. So yes, Lab, Lab, Lab Bois is a great example of a free market solution to regulating kind of drugs and things like that. Of course, imagine the market for real drugs, how much value that could contribute. Scott, who is always after me about politics and about my positions on Trump, um, but puts his money where his mouth is, so I respect that. The 2003 debate with LP, I assume this is my debate with him about immigration, was partially about his concerns Dems would gain too much power to knock us dead and take over. Didn't he see that threat already? Sure, I mean, we all see that threat. I don't want Democrats to gain too much power and knock us dead and take over. My argument was that he, he was doing it the wrong way. It's still my argument, right? I, I, I wish... Um, Trump was not president, and Republicans hadn't lost the House, the Senate, and the presidency. I mean, it seems like the best way to have the Democrats gain too much power and knock us dead and take over is by electing Trump. I mean, Trump was a one-term president who lost the House for Democrats, lost the Senate for Democrats, you, for, for, uh, to the Democrats. Remember, when he took over, when he became president, Republicans had the House, had the Senate, had the presidency. By the time he left, they had ne none of them. So the best strategy to get the Democrats to knock us over is to elect Trump. So sometimes you have to think long term in terms of how do you create divided government that, where the Democrats can't take it all and, 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 and knock us all over. I, you know, you, you, you position the question as if I want the Democrats to win. I don't want the Democrats to win. I want a better Republican Party to win, and if we don't have a better Republican Party, I want divided government. I've always wanted divided government. 
if there was a good Republican, then I'd want Republicans. But I don't see a good Republican. So I just want divided government. I just want stalemate. I like the last six years of Obama. Not much got done. I like the last six years of Clinton. Not much got done because they faced Republican majorities in the House and Senate. You've got to think long term. You've got to think, how are you going to shape the political parties? I think, and I know some of you disagree, and I know Scott disagrees. I think that, that Trump is a disastrous force within the Republican Party, that he would destroy the Republican Party and destroy its capacity to be an opposition party and destroy its capacity to win majorities. And I think that's been at least shown to be partially true, at least for now. That's why one of the reasons I post Trump, because he was really, really bad for the Republican Party. And I want a strong Republican Party. I think Republicans could wipe out the Democrats in 2022. I think they could take the House and maybe take the Senate. But the only thing that can stop them is if they elect in primaries crazy candidates that tend to be the kind of people who support Donald Trump. If they elect more traditional or more pro-free market Republicans, they will beat the Democrats because the American people do not want woke CRT. And, you know, Democrats controlling everything. They don't like Biden. And Biden will only get worse because Biden is not completely there. So what you need are a, a decent, they're not going to be great, but decent Republican candidates who can win and then present an opposition to Biden. And Republicans know how to win. They've won in the House and the Senate over and over and over again until Trump showed up, and then they started losing. It's just the reality. Ian asks, any way you can get Greg Salamieri to talk to Jonathan Roush about his new book, Constitution of Knowledge? Might be a great discussion. That's a good idea. I'll, I'll, I'll raise it with uh, Greg. I'll raise it with Greg soon. Biden has nuclear codes, but he's not going to be allowed anymore. It's not more scary than Trump having them, and neither one of them is going to use them, and there's plenty of safeguards against that, and so I wouldn't worry about it. Brian, wow. Brian got us to 1,200 plus, I think, a little bit. So thank you, Brian. Thank you to all of you. That was amazing. Really, really appreciate it. Um, we've made our target for the month uh, with more than a week to go. Um, and uh, th that's fantastic. Thank you. And as I said, there will be a show tomorrow, 3 o'clock. It'll be the Hangout with $100 contributors. After that show, I'm flying. Direct flight from Puerto Rico to Madrid, Madrid, Tel Aviv. Those of you in Israel right now, I will be in Israel, and I will be doing at least two events in Israel. So uh, look out, check out uh, Boaz Arad's website to find out about those events. But hopefully I can meet some of you. That would be great um, uh, to meet you. And then I will be in London after that. And there should be probably one, maybe two events in London uh, on the following, uh, in two weeks from today, I think, will be the event. So two weeks from today in London. Hopefully some of you can attend. We'd love to meet, meet up with you guys. All right. I think that does it. Thanks, everybody. Really, really, really appreciate it. Um, I'm not going to get my teeth whitened. I see this suddenly, I think because the, the, the camera is better. And uh, now you can see that I have uh, uh, lousy teeth. I've always had lousy teeth. I have no intention of changing my teeth. Um, some of this is a, is a consequence of a birth defect that makes them quite yellow. Uh, it's, very, it's almost impossible to whiten them. I just don't care enough to whiten them. If it bothers you, then listen to the podcast and where you can hear my voice and don't have to see my face. That's fine. I won't get offended. But stop it with, this, with the comments about my teeth. I know they're ugly and they've got a bad color. If my wife can tolerate them, you certainly can as well. You are behind a screen. 
Uh, I didn't. I never stuttered. No, I didn't stutter. So um, uh, it's uh, that I have had bad teeth, and I did not have braces when I was a kid. Probably should have had, and uh, my teeth are just this color because of a drug my mother took when she was pregnant, uh, which is a known side effect. It turned out to be discolored teeth. All right. Paper bag works. Yeah, we can do the show with me with a paper bag on. Thank you, Wonder Freeman. That's exactly what I needed to hear. <laughs> See you all tomorrow at 3 p.m.